if you haven't had a chance to get something to eat, please do so. And this is a very casual um, keynote, so feel free to get up you know, and get yourself something to eat as we're getting started this morning. We've got additional chairs in the back and a few up front, so feel free to make yourself comfortable. Um, I'm Chrissy Lukens. I'm the Director of Academic Technology here at St. Norbert College. We really want to welcome all of our guests um, to St. Norbert. And this is our fourth P3 Transformative Teaching and Technology event. Um, so, uh, Michael Olson, where are you? Michael said to me the other day, he's like, I have been to every one of these. And I was going to look through all of our registrations, and I'm like, you know, there's probably some others who have been to all four, and they deserve a gift. But I changed my mind. Five year anniversary. So for those of you who have been coming all four years, you can't miss next year because we'll have something good for you. Um, I just want to toss out a few thanks um, to my team uh, in ITS, um, Reed Riggle in DLI, uh, Cassandra Voss Center in the library for letting us use their awesome spaces, conference and events. They always do an amazing job with the food, so lunch is going to be great, and I hope you can also stay for our reception at the end. Um, and last but not least, Sandy Gilson, our administrative professional. We could not do this without her help. So she's not here right now because she's taking care of running ITS right now. <laughs> so, um, and just a few reminders, if you haven't uh, used the door prize, there's some tickets in the back of your name tag. We've got just four door prizes in the back. You can choose which one you'd like to put your ticket in. Um, a few logistics. This morning after the keynote, we do have uh, two sessions still taking place in this building down in the lower level. And then the rest of the sessions will be in the library, um, which is just down the sidewalk, follow the crowd and you'll see our library and there's signs posted to the different rooms over there. Um, lunch will be in Michael's Commons, uh, which is directly across from the library. So, and the map is on the website too if you're new to St. Norbert. Uh, the schedule that is on the website, I don't know if you've done this or not, but it's really easily to viewable on your phone and that's where the details are. So we kind of kept the printing as low as we could. Um, you can download the app as well when you go to the schedule website and you just tap the, the phone icon, it will put it into an app view mode and it, it looks really nice on your phone. You might be interested in doing that. At the end of the day, and I'll send an email reminder out on this as well, there is a link on the paper schedule too. If you would please take some time to fill out our evaluation form so that we can make 20 uh, 2018, <laughs> um, even better, and maybe completely different too. So uh, we really would welcome your input and suggestions for that. And for those of you who know me, you know I love maps. Um, and I'm happy to say that we're on the map for this event. There's a really cool uh, OER Open Education Resources world map that is uh, pulling together all of the events that are celebrating Year of the Open, which is an international year to celebrate open education. Um, and we got our event on the map, so I was excited about that. Um, please, uh, if you use Twitter, um, do tweet. Uh, hashtag is on the program. Um, SNC T3 2017. Uh, we would appreciate that. And um, last but not least, I'd like to introduce our keynote, Robin DeRosa. <laughs> she would like to just present right from there, so I said that would be fine. We could just bring it up here and have a conversation. <laughs> um, and as we are uh, live streaming this morning's
keynote, so I'm going to do a toss out to Daniel Linz, if you're watching, because um, Daniel is, was on my team and was instrumental in bringing uh, Robin here. So we want to thank him for that and thank Robin for coming. And I want to share one thing about Robin. So um, Robin is the uh, professor and director of interdisciplinary studies at Plymouth State University. But, um, and she's here to share uh, her expertise in everything about open education. But it just came out yesterday, um, Inside Higher Ed said that your blog is one of the top 50 blogs, must read blogs. So. <laughs> And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read from Inside Higher Ed uh, why we should all be reading Robin's blog, which is awesome, by the way, if you haven't read it. Um, Robin is a champion of open educational resources. Professor Robin DeRosa chronicles her adventures of using OER in her classroom and discusses how other educators can go open with technology and improve their teaching. And so we are very fortunate to have Robin here to share her expertise with us. I'm looking forward to learning a lot. So thanks, Robin. I, I do this a lot. I go and talk to faculty and uh, instructional designers, librarians about open. Um, I tend to like to switch it up a lot because my learning curve is so very steep in this work. And so today, as maybe is somewhat customary, I'm going to do kind of a new thing at the beginning, which means I'll be looking at the slides a lot like, oh, that's what's next? I didn't, I didn't realize. Um, it'll be a happy surprise. And we'll see if we can tie it together, because I've been doing some reading um, particularly over the spring that's really influenced some of what I'm doing in, in the work now. And then the last piece is just that everybody here is probably at really radically different places with open education. Some people are teachers of teachers. You know, you already show people how to do this work and other people aren't exactly sure what we mean when we say open education. So we're going to try to catch everybody up at some point during the presentation without boring those of you who are way out in front. So I'm aware that uh, people are, are at different places. Um, and then when I click that, something should happen. There we go. So a lot of these conversations, the stuff that I'm talking about, do traditionally start with slides like this, which are really about textbook costs. I'm going to explain later maybe why I'm less interested in this than one might think I would be. Um, but I do think the slides are still really provocative when you show them at the outset, right? Because um, you've got those top lines there that show you the steep increases in textbook costs. This one goes uh, a little bit past the beginning of 2015. When we're talking about those costs moving off the charts, we're talking about them uh, rising far faster than the regular consumer price index. So one of the questions I had when I first saw these slides was not only like, oh my god, you know, my students are paying all this money for textbooks, but also, where is all the money going, right? Like, who are we paying when we're paying these exorbitant um, textbook costs? And what are, what are the repercussions for our students? So with a slide like this, we can see these are real dollar amounts, right? So sometimes when people talk about open educational resources, they'll say, students pay $1,200 a semester for textbooks. And a lot of times, those are actually just what textbook costs, what textbooks cost, but not what students actually pay, right? I don't know about your students, but my students do not pay full price for new textbooks all that often. Um, but this is actually a study done by, uh, with about 22,000 students down in Florida, which shows what students are actually paying for textbooks. 56% uh, paying more than 300 bucks a semester, 20% paying more than $500 a semester. Um, I also like to think about that in relationship to the price of tuition, depending on what kind of a school you teach at. 
So at my public four-year university, textbook costs can sometimes run as high as about 10% uh, equivalency to tuition. At some community colleges, it can be as high. I was at a community college a few weeks ago where textbook costs were equal to about 56% of their tuition. So we're talking about numbers that are actually, for students, substantial, right? Even though from our perspective, we're seeing like, oh, it's $200. I know that's a lot. I'm sorry. From their perspective, they're seeing a really mountainous uh, bill there. This is actually a study, that second bullet there, that students do in fact worry more about paying for textbooks than they worry about paying for college, which I think is a shocking, a shocking statistic to see. Um, there is the reclining couch. I'm just waiting for someone <laughs> brave enough. Um, there's also a couple chairs over on the side here, so feel free. Um, I think that that bullet there is interesting, though, when you think about, when you think about paying for tuition, Students generally have a plan for that payment. It might be a really crappy plan, right? But they have a plan. They've got student loans. They might have parental support. They anticipate that bill in advance. But when they go to the bookstore to buy those books, they have no sense of what's coming from them. And they have only five seconds to decide whether they're going to put the card if they're lucky enough to have credits. Um, or, in some cases, they're just not going to buy the book because they can't afford it. This is the slide that started getting me somewhat invested in this textbook question. Because when we're talking about students paying for textbooks, we're really not just talking about high-priced books. We are talking about the same things that faculty actually spend a lot of time talking about, which is student success, student retention, the kinds of student engagement issues that we are directly working on every day in our classrooms. This comes again from that Florida 2016 survey. Um, they replicated this survey. It was first done in 2012, done again in 2016. So uh, these numbers have been stable. I think they're quite persuasive. 67% of students in this study reported not purchasing a required textbook. This surprises exactly none of us, right? Because on the first day that you're expecting your students to have the textbook, there's always a small cohort of students who don't have it. They're waiting for their check to clear. They're going to get it on reserve in the library. They're sharing it with their friend next to them. Um, we are accustomed to seeing that. And the data is bearing it out that students are not purchasing textbooks that are required. But I think it gets even more shocking as we go down, and these are the things that are less visible to us as faculty. 38% report that they earned a poor grade in a class directly because they could not afford a textbook for the course. 20% report that they failed a class because they couldn't afford the textbook. 48% occasionally or frequently took fewer classes. This, I think, is where administrators should probably start to perk up, because what we're talking about there is taking fewer credits. There's a double whammy there, right? There's lost credit revenue for the institution right off the bat. But then what we're talking about is extending time to graduation. And the data shows us that when we extend time to graduation, we decrease the likelihood that a student will actually graduate. So when we're talking about taking fewer courses because of book costs, we are actually talking about whether that student is going to make it through college. 26% um, dropped a course and 21% withdrew from a course because of high textbook costs. These are, again, numbers that are directly related to student completion and retention. And that stuff was stuff I was accustomed to caring about, I think, as a faculty member. Um, when I talk about what we call open educational resources, or these sort of free, openly licensed digital materials that we're going to talk about, I'm actually not talking about textbook costs. I'm talking about that last slide, which is about access to higher education. It's about whether or not our students are going to have access to come to the table to learn, and whether they're going to be able to stay at the table and succeed. So that was the stuff that I cared about. I don't really want to be at the front of a movement about cheap textbooks. Like, cheap textbooks, like, who cares? Like, I don't even, textbooks? I don't want to be in front of any movement, really, that focuses on textbooks. To me, this is not a movement about textbooks. It's a movement about access to higher education. In that sense, I want to broaden the way that we think about open and about uh, OER in particular. I'm going to keep clicking until something happens. So let's look at, um, 
at Wisconsin, and St. Norbert as maybe an example, although some of you are from different institutions that will have radically different and sometimes bleaker statistics uh, than what we're seeing here. So first of all, a national statistics that, a statistic is that Americans with four-year degrees make 98% more an hour than people without a degree. The reason that I care about this, which sometimes we call the wage bump, right, that what happens when you get that college credential to your likely earning potential, right, that sort of wage bump that you get. The problem with the wage bump is that you don't get it if you don't graduate. And the even bigger problem is that if you go to college and you get some credits, you're likely accumulating debt as you get those credits. And then when you don't graduate and you don't get the wage bump, you've got this awful double sort of irony, right? Which is that you accumulated debt and you didn't ultimately get the payoff of having that degree. More than 31 million students in the last 20 years have failed to complete college. Those are students who started and didn't finish, right? We, we say students with credit but no credential. Um, these are really troubling statistics that do affect even what we call, what might think of as more elite private institutions, right? At St. Norbert, the graduation rate right now is at 72%. Sometimes new faculty are like, oh my God, you know, and I'm like, dude, that is good, right? 72% is a really good graduation rate. Um, at the public institution where I teach, we're, we're batting more like one out of two. One out of every two students will graduate. That's a pretty, uh, a pretty common national average. Community colleges can sometimes be lower. Um, this is a norm that we have now, which is that we're just losing lots of students. It's great to talk about student engagement, and we're going to talk about that in a big way. But one of the things that we very rarely talk about, is, particularly as faculty, when we're looking at the students that we're losing, is money, right? It's, it's the, the question of how much college costs and whether they can afford to stay here to complete the credits that they want to. Um, the average total indebtedness of the 2015 graduating class um, at St. Norbert, 35,641. We're talking about a significant debt. More to the point, maybe in some ways, though, is imagine the student leaving, for example, in their junior year, who's maybe got three quarters of that debt and doesn't have the credential when they leave, right? So for me, these became social justice issues when I started seeing how, how these graphs looked. Um, we do know at St. Norbert, for example, uh, that about three quarters of your students are uh, applying for and receiving financial aid, right? So we are talking at most of our institutions, um, even the ones where it seems somewhat invisible, uh, that we are talking about a problem that affects the majority of our students in some way or other. Click. Maybe. You know if you click it twice, it's going to go twice. So I want to just uh, pause briefly to mention three books that have affected my learning about this stuff over the last few months and, and affected how I talk about the beginning of these, um, these slides. And I will tell you that on the hashtag for today, I, I will tweet out uh, both this presentation and three tweets about these three books that I'm going to mention so you don't have to like, you know, write them down if you're on Twitter. Um, so the first is a book by Sarah Goldrick Rabb called Paying the Price, where she breaks down the challenges of college financial aid. Um, and she is particularly interested in talking about what we might call the real cost of college. Not the tuition price, but the full cost uh, that is required to be paid by students in order to come to school. So that includes, of course, tuition, but also things like textbooks, right? As we just saw on the slide before, if you can't afford them, you really can't afford school, right? You end up not making it through. Um, but also, you need to get to class, right? Your transportation costs. If you're a parent, your child care costs. Um, food and shelter, right, that are required, these basic survival issues uh, that you need to care for in order to go and study. And what we call lost opportunity costs, right? If a, if a student's going to go to school, that's a student who could have been working those full hours. Even if they can afford the tuition, can they afford the loss of revenue from the income during the hours that they would have normally been working? Um, when I started to care about textbooks, it didn't make any sense not to care about all the other things as well. It was just too random to be like, I'm going to lower the cost of this book. See you later, right? So I started thinking, actually, all of this stuff is what I do. And I mean, I have a PhD in early American literature. I'm not like, this is not my world, right? 
But it is my world, it's all of our worlds, right? It's not a world that we can afford uh, to ignore from the, the specialties of our own disciplines. So I started paying a little bit more attention to the wider view. I started thinking about like, what did my teaching actually look like? And those starred domains there, that's, that's really where I had been living before I started doing this work. I, you know, the Italian in me, I realized with the slides up there, like if you take any still shots, it's gonna be me like this all day long. But, um, but I was basically spending my time in, the, in those three domains, right? So the domain of knowing, this was like the content of my discipline, right? I got to teach you these things. You have to, you have to know about Alauda Equiano and, you know, uh, what happened to him and his narrative and his dates and the history behind it and whatever. Um, and then I hoped that students would really gain a kind of understanding, right? They wouldn't just be a, a rote memory. They would really be able to ask inquisitive questions about things. They would be able to be critical. Um, and then ultimately, they would be able to do things, you know, with that information, right? They'd be able to take the, the knowledge bits and uh, push them into directions that I hadn't imagined. And, and that was great, right? That was successful teaching from no to thrive. And that was what I did. So since I started working in open, I've realized I have really expanded sort of the flow chart of my own teaching. And the stuff I'm talking about now is really in that first category of survive. How can my students come to know the content of my discipline if they can't even get to the table in the first place, right? If they are precluded from learning because it's too expensive for them to get to class or because the textbook that contains the information that they have to learn uh, costs $140 and they can't get that until the third week, at which point they're already failing and it's too late, right? Um, so I started caring about that step from survive in to know a little bit more. Um, and it led me to do these things. And again, I just sort of remind you, like, I'm just a teacher, right? Like, I, I, you know, I'm not a dean. I, I, this is just work that I did more or less from inside my own program. Um, I started with open educational resources. We'll talk about that in a second. As I converted to open educational resources, it meant that the textbooks were going to be digital. Can you imagine on the first day of class? I'm so proud. There are no textbook costs for this course. Now take out your $900 laptops and let's get to work, right? So my college did not have a laptop checkout program at the library, so I had to find money um, to purchase those laptops and put those in circulation before we started the OER initiative. Um, then you think about it, right? A student um, who's grown up all their life with an iPad and a cell phone and whatever, and you tell them, hey, we're gonna try this new app, jump on, get a username, play around. You can break it if you want, right? That's, our, that's the cool thing we say now. You can break it, right? If you've never played with technology because, for example, you don't have broadband at your house, you don't have any personal devices, you're working on a blank laptop from your help desk that doesn't have any of your things auto-loaded, it's a lot harder to get in and just sort of be cool experimenting, right? So we put in a, a tech mentorship program right with our own students, right? Students who had just finished doing the work um, were hired at a student hourly rate to work with other students to sit by them with their technology um, and help them work. Uh, and that was when it just started growing, right? I realized, gosh, once I'm starting to take care of these basic come to the table needs, I should look at all the reasons that my students aren't coming to the table, right? We started, we opened on Sundays and we opened um, on Monday nights. We closed on Fridays to make room for that. It was fine, right? We met the students where they were. Um, we opened a food pantry. You know, we already had a, a food pantry on our campus. We opened one right there next to the office desk, right? Just put a food pantry right in there. How long did it take us? It took like three days to get that off the ground, right? It wasn't overly complicated. Once we had a food pantry up, we could open up a ride board um, and a childcare uh, co-op sign-up sheet to help students when their car broke down and they couldn't get to class, right? Or they, their uh, childcare fell through and they needed last minute babysitting. Um, we serve a lot of active um, and retired military in the program that I, that I run. So we started a veterans mentorship program. It's really complicated to do a customized degree like my students do if you're on the GI Bill because of how the GI Bill pays for college. So we put in some mentorship programs like that. We just started looking around at all of the access issues 
that we're keeping our students out of the conversation. And instead of waiting for large-scale university programs or statewide initiatives, we just started using the community that we had to solve the problems. This was the gift that OER gave me, right? It was much bigger than just reducing textbook costs. Um, and Oh, hello, now we're gonna do that, are we? There we go. Um, so OER really opened that piece there in between survive and know, which expanded these kind of domains of how I was considering um, my job. So I wanna talk briefly about, about OER and about how that really does kind of effectively solve the textbook crisis, right? Some of these other ones are bigger, food insecurity, right? We're not gonna solve this right now, you know, this statistic, um, one in 11 Wisconsin families are food insecure, over 500,000 families in Wisconsin. The likelihood that you are teaching some of those students is very high, right, wherever you teach, one in 11 families. We're not gonna be able to solve that. You can put a food pantry in your, um, in your department. We won't solve food insecurity in Wisconsin right now. We can solve textbooks right this second through open educational resources. So OERs um, are not just free digital textbooks. They are free digital textbooks that carry what we call the open license. Creative Commons has a series of these licenses. Um, what happens is if I write a textbook, I, it's copyrighted to me, that's by virtue of the expression. So you don't lose your copyright, copyright with a Creative Commons license, you keep it. But this license sits on top of the copyright. So basically, if I write something and it's copyrighted and you want to use it, you need to call me up on the phone and be like, Robin, can I? And I'll be like, yes, you may. For $42, you can have that thing, right? What the Creative Commons license does is it allows you to put a license next to your copyright that says, I give you advanced permission to use this in the following ways. It's really a license to share. It's a license to share. The most open license is the CC, Creative Commons, by, which is an attribution license. You can use anything you want from this thing, as long as you say that it's by Robin DeRosa. You attribute it to me. That is the most open of the open license, licenses, but there's many others you can pick from. You can pick, um, my students very often like to choose the CC by NC. This is CC by attribution, non-commercial. So what that means is you can use this thing that I've created, but you may not make any money off it. And I always think like, are, you, are people like lining up to monetize my students' work? Like how, how did I, but they all put the CC, but no one's gotta make a buck off this if I'm not making a buck. I'm like, okay, fine. Um, so you can, you can pick the kind of license that you want. Uh, what's happened is that people have gone out and they've written materials for courses, including full textbooks, and they've put these licenses on them that make them free for you to use. They carry what we call the five R's. I never quote them because I always mess them up, but they're things like you can reuse them, you can redistribute them, your students can retain them, you can revise them, recycle is not one of them, but I feel like it, sh <laughs> it should be. Um, so people have gone out and they've made these books um, and uh, they've gotten grants to fund them, um, so especially with certain places like OpenStax, um, you can just go grab an intro biology book. These are rated at the same or better quality than traditional textbooks by both faculty and student users again and again and again. Um, if you have a classic conventional intro level textbook in your course and you're not using one of these, I actually think I think that's an ethical problem for me, like quite honestly. Um, these books are uh, terrific and they're ready to go. Now the more specialized you get, the less likely it is that there's one of these books ready to go. You might have to wait another four or five years. Then it'll be ready to go and the commercial textbook industry will be dead. Let's just make it go faster, right? There's no reason to wait any longer uh, to replace textbooks um, with open educational resources from uh, places like o OpenStax and others. This is a, a study that came out in 2017. It's actually a study of studies. So it looked at a whole series, all of the studies that had come out about OER and um, its quality and efficacy. And it's really remarkable. So again, this is not just this one study, right? This is, they surveyed all of the studies and they found that students who use OER perform significantly better on the course throughput rate than their peers who use traditional textbooks in both face-to-face -face and online courses that use OER. The throughput rate is the gold of what we are talking about when we're talking about quote unquote student success, right? 
It's an aggregate of drops, withdrawals, and C or better pass rates. So the, the, the rate of people passing with C or better went up, and the rate of students dropping um, or withdrawing the course went down. So we are talking about, uh, about serious success in using these materials. Um, is that good? Yes. I mean, we should just do it. It's easy, but done. We don't need to talk about it anymore. I want to talk about something more interesting, because to me, that's just basic, right? What, what I did when I started using OER was you know, replace what in my class was just an $87 textbook. So that was great. It was an immediate win. That turned out to be the least interesting thing about using the open resources. So that's what I want to talk about now is this final domain, right? Once I opened up the beginning and I started using the OER, this whole other part of teaching opened up for me that I had not anticipated before. Um, and that's what I want to talk about by talking about the first OER that I used in my course. Um, so again, I am a PhD in early American literature. My period is roughly like 1400 to 1800 in uh, US history and literature. So if you know anything about the period, if you know like copyright law, there's something kind of interesting about literature from 1400 to 1800, which is what? Yeah, it's all in the public domain. So my students were paying $87 for the Heath anthology of, it should have said, public domain literature, right? Um, and I, I, when I went and I learned about OER, and I thought about my own field, I was just like, oh my god, that's horrible, right? So I figured, you know, this seems like something we can solve. So click. I think it depends a little bit on how I'm aiming. There we go. So I went on my department's Facebook page and I just put a little call out to students and I said, does anybody want to spend this summer? We're going to build a replacement for the Heath Anthology and we'll use it next semester. Who wants to help? And I had 10 students volunteer. They were actually a really interesting mix of students. They were um, students who had just finished the class. They were students who were about to take the class and were like, hell yeah, I'll replace the textbook with a free textbook. Uh, and then there were some alums who had actually already graduated from the program and, and were out uh, working. And all these students wanted to work. Um, I did end up paying them a very small amount because it was a summer project not associated with a class. One of the things I want to say is that open educational resources are free for students to use but they're not free to create, right? That's a huge myth, um, the sort of misunderstanding of OER. It takes academic labor to create materials like this, and academic labor is real labor. It should be compensated. We should think about this in particular when we're talking about contingent faculty who are being encouraged to make OER, who don't have year-round salaries, you know, paying the bill. Um, how are you going to seed and fund the creation of OER? And we've got lots of solutions for that, so we can talk about it if you're interested. But for this one, um, I got a small grant from myself. I literally just, I went to my provost, I went to my department chair. There was no money to be had because this was before people knew what this stuff was, right? So I paid for it myself. It cost $400 to build the first round of this anthology. The reason I tell you that is because you could probably find $400 now for open. You really can. Um, we have lots of, of good places to look. But what we did is the students just went out. They started finding public domain versions of the text. This was not super simple, right, because it, it could be copyrighted. Um, it, you know, just because you find it on the internet doesn't mean it's, it's free to take. Um, but we ultimately built, built a little replacement, um, and we were ready to go in the fall with a kind of skeletal version of the Heath Anthology of American Literature online and totally free. Um, I thought it was great until about the second week of school when my students basically said, this is the worst thing we ever used and we hate it. And I was like, oh. You know, because on the first day, I was like a hero, right? It was like, free books, you know, DeRosa, right? On this, the second week, it was like, we hate you, this sucks. Because think about it this way, right? One of the early texts in the course, Cabeza de Vaca, uh, he's a Spaniard, he's like down in southeast Florida, shipwrecked, whatever. And immediately, they're like, he's a Spaniard? He, where is he? And then they're, you know, Columbus, he's in Hispaniola. Hispaniola? What are you? They don't understand anything, right? They, they, they're shocked and they like what the textbooks used to offer, right? The little intros when they're like, I know you thought the pilgrims discovered America, but actually that is totally offensive and gross, right? Um, so they were missing all those little introductory pieces. They were missing footnotes. They were missing illustrations and maps. And I had a moment of panic 
followed by like a pretty obvious epiphany, right? Which is like, oh, this is the work my students were gonna do anyway. Can't they just do this work and instead of putting it on Moodle, or what do you guys have for your LMS Moodle? You have Blackboard, Canvas, whatever you have. Instead of sticking it in there, we'll put it in the textbook um, and we will build this thing together you know, actually just in a week in advance of when we need it. So for example, when we got to the Pueblo Revolt, you can see my students, Justin and Simon, they wrote a little introduction to the Pueblo Revolt, they researched it, they dropped in some public domain images of the Pueblo Revolt, um, and then it started getting fun because it was time to study the Pueblo Revolt and people are reading Justin and Simon. So of course Justin and Simon are like, hello, we wrote the textbook, what can we do for you? Um, so it was like this really um, awesome group activity and we started getting really fired up and we realized like, what could we not put in this textbook, right? Like what do you do? You make an infographic, you wanna build maps. Uh, this guy Jonathan, he made little videos that were super fun, so here's him talking about the Haitian Revolution. He'd do these like two minute little intros that we'd be able to stick in um, just before the, the texts that they were reading. And we realized like this, there's no end to what we could do. Discussion questions. They love writing assessments, right? They're like, I'm gonna write a test. I'm like, we don't even do tests in this class. It's for other people, right? <laughs> other people have to take our test. They loved it, right? So that we, we could drop in just virtually anything that we wanted. Um, we could drop in current events. So if something happened in the world that had resonance, this of course, uh, as the pipeline stuff was, was getting going, there were some pretty interesting questions to be asked there because we have a whole section on um, Native American literature and sort of uh, the water protector mythologies and um, histories that we were reading about. We could, we could pull some of that contemporary stuff in link it to the text. I mean, it was just, there was no end to what we could do with this textbook. And then I started getting like, you know, sort of like caffeinated about it all, right? So I layered in an app called Hypothesis, um, which is a little app that allows, you can see there, you can highlight text and then you can um, annotate it like a close reading app. But the cool thing is that it's interactive and public, so the students could annotate and talk to each other about the stuff. Now, they were probably annotating their Heath anthologies, but I doubt very much, right? Um, when we first started using this, uh, Hypothesis was still in development, so the guys who were building it, um, especially one guy, Jeremy Dean, was really paying attention to my class and how they were using it. So he tracked their annotations and 18 students in the course of one semester using this textbook put more than 10,000 annotations into this anthology. I'm gonna guess that's a lot more than anybody would have ever put into the Heath Anthology. They started uh, putting links in there, um, jokes, you know, like questions for each other. So it really became this dynamic kind of meeting place, not just a textbook. Um, and that's when I realized that this textbook, saving $87 was the least of what was exciting about this textbook. And that's why open textbooks are different than free textbooks. Because open textbooks have those five R's. They let you get inside. They let you interact with them. They let you rebuild it or change it or transform it as you want. Even if you don't do that, that sense of having that access to your materials changes your relationship to the learning, I think. And it really invigorated my students in a profound way. Um, and that is the kind of thing that led me to think not just about OER and access and survival and money, but also about what we are starting to call open pedagogy. What, is, what are the pedagogical practices that go with using materials like this, right? Um, and how do, how do they work? Um, so we already talked about how the open license can reduce barriers to education, make us rethink access, and how the open license can, uh, as it did with my textbook, my first textbook project, empower learners. But I also want to talk really briefly about two last pieces of open pedagogy, which are that the open license can facilitate connection and cl collaboration and also help to build support for higher education, uh, which I think is something that's sorely needed at the moment. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what we might call or what is sometimes called connected learning. Um, I'm sorry that it's a little cranky. It just keeps wanting to tell me that, even though we're aware. So when I think about sort of structurally, the architecture for learning, and so this is where sometimes the instructional designers and the technologists are like, go home now, <laughs> because 
I'm going to beat up a little bit on Moodle or Canvas or Blackboard or whatever LMS. And the instructional designers, the technologists, they often feel the same way I do. But one of their jobs is just to get the damn faculty onto Moodle in the first place, right? And I'm like, get off the Moodle. But I think about Moodle as like an Alcatraz, right? Everything, it's like an island where everything is absolutely locked away. And there's some small benefits to that. Actually, they're not really small, right? One is a certain kind of safety, um, that sort of sandbox experimental safety mentality. I think that's a little bit of a myth, right? Um, your classroom is only as safe as you are able to ignore the ways in which it's unsafe for some of the students who are probably sitting in there already, right? But, but in general, we understand that there's uh, something beneficial about having that kind of private and bounded space sometimes. But, you know, here we go, we get, we get these machines, we call them laptops, they connect you to the world, and then we build this architecture that keeps our students totally locked down, right? It's just kind of bizarre to me. The worst thing I think about the LMS is the symbolics of what happens at the end of the semester, right? So you have finished your course, all sorts of amazing things have happened in your class, and now you're getting ready because you gotta teach it again in the spring or the fall. So you're importing your old class into your new shell or whatever. And what, what leaves as you make the import? All the student work, right? Every single thing the students contributed goes away and you can start fresh. And the, when I thought about the symbolics of that, I literally, like I actually wanted to be ill, right? The message there is that everything that you've produced in this class does not matter. It doesn't matter to knowledge, it doesn't matter to the field, it doesn't matter to my course. Um, we just need to get rid of it so I can do this whole thing again. And I wanted to stop building architectures that had symbolics like that. I wanted to start building architectures where when the students did work, it actually transformed my class. It transformed the field, and then the work lived with them. It wasn't attached to my course. It wasn't attached to me. I didn't have control over it. It lived with them so that they could keep it when the class ended. So I wanted to build architectures more like the house on the right where you build whatever you want. I, I think about it like um, there's an old children's book called The Big Orange Splot. Does everyone know this book? Oh my gosh, Google it. It's so good. Uh, this guy, like, bird drops some paint on his house and ends up, instead of this like, you know, sort of cookie cutter row house, by the end, everybody's transformed their houses into these crazy, amazing individual, um, you know, works of architecture. So I wanted students to build houses like that that really reflected who they were, to work in those digital spaces. And then I wanted to build driveways and roadways and highways that would move people to those spaces for a visit, right? So that they weren't locked down, they were able to share, uh, to share their stuff. So there's a pilot that's going on sort of nationally. I call it a pilot, it's a program in some places, but most schools are sort of in this pilot mode now with what's called domain of one zone. It's the idea that when a student comes into college, um, instead of getting locked into four separate Moodles, they get a URL or a domain, and they can work there in that space that's attached to them, not to their courses. I started doing uh, this kind of in a rogue sort of way where my students would just build individual websites. Now my school has moved into the domains program. Um, whether your school's interested in domains or not, whether you want to go fully in this direction or not, the idea is worth thinking about, right? How can you build, bring your students into a more sort of public um, uh, venue and allow them to share their work with the world, not just flush it down the sort of you know, Moodle delete bin? Um, so you can see on the right here, this is a, st a student's e-port. Um, in my program, we call them e-ports partially as a nod to the idea of the e-portfolio, which is something that you know, it's a buzzword, people understand what you mean. But we specifically change it from ePortfolio to port to think more of a port of call. So instead of a place to just post your like LinkedIn profile and your like four best projects, this would be a place like a portal where you could invite people in, you know, come and stay a while, talk to me, work with me, share my process, not just my perfect products and let this be a vibrant network space for learning. So Kaylee's ePort there does not look like ePorts that other students have built. They build them from blank server space. 
Um, that sounds intimidating, except for the fact that I am an early Americanist. <laughs> so if I can do this, you can do this too. Um, my husband is a, the head of our sculpture program. He now uses ePorts. Uh, he's not really even an emailer, right? But uh, you, you can learn this, right? It takes uh, almost everything I show you in, in here is about an hour learning curve. You want to build a textbook, you want to use hypothesis, you want to build ePorts. If you have basic tech savvy, you can use an iPad, you can work your TV remote control, you can send an email. We can teach you most of these things in an hour. Um, what happens to learning? if students control their own spaces. They control the data that's generated by them. They control what lives there after the course is over. Maybe they're like, I hated that course. I'm deleting it all. Great, right? It's your stuff. You get to control it. Uh, there's a, a cool thing. This is a sort of pretty soon after Kaylee started her ePort. You can kind of see it. She's got a blog section. She's got me. She's got this thing called Twice Told Tales. And I was like, what the heck? What's that, Kaylee? So I clicked on it. And what it was is she started this for my class, and she started getting so annoyed that in this other class, which happened to be called Twice Told Tales, she was doing all this work that she was really proud of, and she was shoving it in Moodle, and she knew where that work was going to go. So she built a section on her ePort for this other class. It was not required to be there. I'm sure no one in that class ever looked at it over there. But for her, it was part of her, part of her learning. Now in my interdisciplinary studies program, our students are taught that it doesn't matter if your professor tells you post this on your ePort, right? They know that they want to be posting and curating and thinking out loud and synthesizing in that space outside of the class assignments, right? This is a space um, not only for them to put class assignments, but also for them to control their own learning and their own decisions about what work they want to be doing. So if the ePort is like the home, I had to build some pathways to drive people in, right? The first thing that happens is a student makes this amazing blog post. They're so excited about it. And they think immediately the world will start replying to them. And of course, that does not happen, right? Nobody goes. Um, so these are the roads that we build, right? You can build them through any kinds of, of social media. We use Twitter in our program to build these roads. This is an example from a, a sister institution of mine, Keene State College, where a student wrote a, a post about this kind of work. Um, and then she actually posted her blog stats because on that one day, she had 196 views of that. You know, she's, her mind is blown because never in Moodle had 196 people um, you know, interacted with her work. Uh, this is a student of mine. Um, he had just transferred out of a community college, so he was starting a four-year degree. He had done uh, heating and air conditioning and was quite sure that the four-year college was not going to be a good match for him. He was very, very nervous. He had a learning disability, which he blogged about on the first day, basically. Um, and he had actually this brilliant post about how grades were a problem, because in order to learn, you have to fail. And when you fail, you get penalized with a bad grade. And so you're therefore penalized for learning. And so he just had a little simple thing. And I was like, oh, God, it's brilliant. I blog about that shit all the time. Nobody cares, right? When he blogged, people paid attention because it was his life that he was talking about. So it got picked up by Tara Robertson, who works over in British Columbia as an um, access provider for open textbooks. She works on uh, learning disabilities, um, vision impairment, that kind of stuff. She was really moved. She shared his post. Day one, the student who thinks maybe this isn't the right school for me is getting this kind of feedback from a public that thinks his voice is really meaningful in these conversations. So this was meaningful work. Um, here's a student in my program who uh, a couple of months ago had a piece. That, so, this, so this is Kaylee, whose ePort that you just saw. The piece that I showed on that ePort got picked up by the Association for Interdisciplinary Studies and just published in their publication called Integrative Pathways. Um, these things happen all the time because students do have important things to share, particularly about the experience of learning, which is something that in the scholarship of teaching and learning, we care a lot about, but we very rarely make room to listen. When they write about this stuff, even if they are in an introductory particle physics class, right, they're not going to come out with some new research on a new particle. right? Um, that's not what they bring to the table, right? What they bring to the table is a perspective on learning about that work that really is of interest even sometimes to very high level researchers in those fields. Um, 
I mostly don't use Twitter anymore. I just use TweetDeck, um, which is an app that organizes Twitter into things like hashtags and feeds, right? So I teach my students how to build what we call these PLNs, or these personal learning networks. The idea being that it's not up to me to build the pathways and the roadways into their eports, because they're all studying slightly different things with slightly different constellations of interests that are made up of a holistic relationship right, between themselves and all of the activities that they're engaged in in their lives. They build those personal learning networks in only the ways that they can, which is a, a, a map and a pathway individual to who they are. Um, but that's a teachable skill. We can teach faculty to do it. We can teach students to do it. Um, and when we connect them up that way, if we do it early enough, by the time they graduate, they don't need to go to the internship office or the career center, right? They've already built those robust networks, so they can put out a site. I'm ready. Like, you know, I'm ready to come. Where's my next step going to be? Because they have um, shared their work into a community of practice for many years already. So here's the sort of takeaway. Um, I think that by thinking about open, we can expand a little bit the flowchart of our, of our teaching. Um, we can think a little bit more about how to get more students to the table and how to keep them there when we think not just about textbook costs, but about access broadly writ, right? What are the access issues that prevent my students from learning? Um, and then we can expand, uh, expand after our students are thriving with the kinds of um, disciplinary content that we teach, how can we get them to contribute to their communities of practice, both scholarly and professional? And how can we get them ultimately not just to learn what is given to them, but to take what's given to them and transform it so the world that they enter after graduation is actually a world that they've helped to shape. Right, not just a world that they've inherited. Um, so I think that open opens the beginning and the ends of those flowcharts. There's probably more, you know, on both sides that I haven't discovered yet, and that will be the next series of slides um, for another keynote. Um, so, ooh, hello. I don't know. Uh, these are some of the tools. Um, the red things are all the different parts of my syllabi that have completely transformed since I started doing open work. So you can imagine how, for example, the, um, the required you know, course readings have changed now that I'm using OER. But my students write all their own course policies now. They write all their own attendance policies. They write their late policies. They organize their grading practices, the whole nine yards. You don't have to do that. First of all, are you a full professor with tenure? And I, I say that without tongue in cheek, right? This matters. Some of this is, is risky. You might be an outlier in your institution to work this way. What kinds of security do you have for taking risks in the classroom? What kind of tenure protections do you have? Are you actively organizing for tenure protections to be extended across your teaching faculty, right, to people at every level? Um, but some of the blue ones there are the tools that I found particularly helpful. Um, we are going to have a session this afternoon, which is uh, kind of like a Q&A workshop-y thing. So that'll be a great time to dig into how do, you write a, how do you write learning outcomes with your students? I got an accredited program. That's not going to work, right? How do we dial, drill down into that stuff? Or like, what is Pressbooks? I want to build my own textbook, but I don't know how to do it. It's, isn't it really hard? And the answer is always going to be, no, it's not. Let me, take, let me show you. How do we build ePorts? Um, so we can talk about some of that stuff this afternoon if you are interested. Um, but I think we have about five minutes left, maybe. Maybe. Hard to say. Three. Um, so I'm happy to take one or two questions, and we can save the rest for this afternoon if you've got them. Yes, ma'am. So Yeah, people always ask me that, and, it, and it's so funny because I always think, oh, it, it's more exciting. Like, the first round was, was horrifying like, because we had to go find the stupid tag, you know. So let me say a couple things about that textbook. Um, the Open Anthology of Early American Literature has now been funded by the Hewlett Foundation and picked up by a, a community organizing group around OER called Rebus. Um, so now, because I got the big bucks, they're actually going to build the most, I mean, and so I'm out of the project now. Um, but 
but my student work is all in there. So when this thing is finished in about a year, it's gonna replace the Norton Anthology, the Heath Anthology, the Bedford St. Martin, and it's gonna be phenomenal. I say that because I also want to point out that it started with what was not a very phenomenal textbook, right? The one we built was like, oh, I mean, there's some bad stuff in there, right? It was sort of mediocre. Mediocre is a fine place to start with OER because other people are going to come in and they're going to rebuild and make it better. Um, so the cool thing about this project is what started kind of mediocre is going to be improved every time. I cannot imagine, though, the end point of the open anthology of early American literature. Because after we get every early American literature text, right, which is funny because that'll take forever, right? But once we get that, we can start reorganizing it. So for example, maybe your student class, what they need to do is take all these texts and reorganize it. Maybe you want to do one um, about uh, domination and oppression in early American literature. So you take all the texts and you regroup them according to thematics, right? And now they're organized in a totally new way. Maybe you want to teach a class on regional American literature for, uh, for Midwestern lit, right? And you just select out those texts. Um, maybe you want your students, for example, to write a, a companion text where every text has a parallel contemporary um, text for something that's going on right now that has its roots in that history. Lord knows, we're taking down Confederate statues right now. I mean, this is a prime time to study early American literature, right? So to me, there's the problem with static textbooks is that they're almost always outdated in some way, right? By the time you're using it, um, the average time to, to redo a textbook is about three years. So you know, the, there's a great video where they talk about like, Pluto's not a planet, but it's going to take those guys three years, you know, from the time they made that scientific announcement. Although I think I heard, I don't know, Pluto up in the air. Oh, that's funny. Um, so the cool thing I think about the open stuff is that because it can be so current, you can constantly be adding and changing. So I think the first build is actually kind of the annoying one because you got to get certain kinds of content in there, and that's a little bit laborious. I'd rather get that funded do it as faculty, and then let the students play forever uh, with, the, with the five R's, because that's where I think it gets more exciting. Um, I saw one more. I'll take it real fast, then I know where we've got to go. So. Are you talking about faculty? Yeah. Okay, so, um, so first of all, I was in the English department, now I'm in the DeRosa department of one, which is a happy place to be sometimes, right? So I can be like, our whole program is gonna do this because I am the whole program, right? <laughs> um, but, but what we have done at the University System of New Hampshire is I've been working on a statewide level with a committee of uh, folks from across all four of our state campuses, and we incentivize this work. So we fund at um, $2,000, per faculty member. Um, it's a year-long commitment that you make. You get $2,000, you get um, educated like in a day like this, and then you get follow-up support team help. And you can get funded on, on three areas. Um, open educational resources, if you want to just flip and convert a textbook to save money. Open pedagogy, if you want to do some of these other principles that I'm looking at there or open access to research if you want to look at um, the open sharing of uh, resource materials with faculty resource and open access publishing. Um, we got that money from our board of trustees. Remember, like, my school's in a major bu budget crisis. New Hampshire's one of the last in the nation for public funding of higher education. They cannot give us too much money. They're like, take it. You want a million? Take it, take it. So we got $400,000 for this program at a time where I can't get $25 um, you know, to buy a chair, you know, like for my butt, right? Like literally. Um, the reason is that the data show some pretty impressive things for things like retention and throughput rates. So there is funding available for this, both in your own, in your own systems and then also lots of grant funds from places like Hewlett and Gates and Davis uh, who are funding at a very high level uh, OER initiatives. So that's what I would suggest is you pay faculty for the time it takes to do this work. Um, and that's those, that, those small seeds pay off. So in our first pilot where we had nine faculty, um, you know, didn't know anything about what we were doing and it was like way early, we saved hundred and I think $40,000 for students in the first year. Um, but most, most pilots, I mean, we're, we're definitely uh, more around the million dollar mark at this point. 
Um, I wish that we had more time to chat, but I'll be around and uh, look forward to talking to you this afternoon. Come find me if you, if you need me. that I want to give to Robin before she ducks off to her session is this is not the first time she's spoken uh, to us at St. Norbert. You were, and that might have been where you saw me the first time, you were a guest for our Dig Pins course. Oh, that's right, yeah. So we have offered Not like some here, but online. Online. Was like, she was a, our virtual <laughs> guest for um, some professional development offerings that we did this past year that focused on digital pedagogy, identity networks, and scholarship. And that was an effort to help faculty understand their place in those um, spaces before diving in and working with their students in those spaces. And we ended up making Dig Pins pins. Oh. So you get a Dig Pins <laughs> awesome. pin. Awesome. <laughs> oh, it's so cute for being too. one of our guests. Thank you. So um, help yourself to the rest of the breakfast items that are still here and enjoy your sessions, and we'll see you at lunch. <laughs>